Thanksgiving, got a good break from the midterm, and are all ready to go for the sort of back two thirds of CRIM 103. So we'll be moving a little bit away from theory for the rest of the semester, focusing more on some like practical, pragmatic issues with respect to how psychological theories actually help contribute to the explanation of crime. But before we get to that, we will just touch very briefly on some of the material from, I think it's chapter 5, that focuses on psychodynamic theories, personality, and temperament. So for the lecture themes for this lecture, we'll talk a little bit about personality, cognition, and behavior, then we'll move into a, a more somber topic, which is we'll talk a little bit about mass shootings and school shootings. So we'll look at how they happen, why they happen, we'll address some of the myths that exist within the public about whether these shootings are in fact senseless and unpredictable, and then we'll look at a model that we can use to help try and explain involvement in school shootings, and then we'll look at how this model actually can be used to understand one specific incident that involved Adam Lanza and the shooting of many children and school teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary School in the United States. But to get started with our discussion of personality and cognition, I, again, I, I don't really like talking too much about psychodynamic theories because they're really not accurate, but they form such a big part of the building blocks towards key personality-based perspectives and key theories. It's just why we kind of need to understand where we're actually coming from. So when it comes to psychodynamic theories, we can see there's, there's an early example of a theory of criminal behavior that emerged from psychology, even though Freud never really talked about criminal behavior itself. The psychodynamic theoretical perspective emphasizes the inability of internal psychological forces, so like what's going on inside of our brains, to actually control our antisocial impulses. My dog is freaking out right now. So the psychodynamic theoretical perspective assumes that humans are inherently antisocial. What's useful to understand about this theoretical perspective is that this is sort of like where social control theory got its key ideas. Remember, control theories try to explain why people do not go on to engage in criminal behavior. Psychodynamic theories make this assumption that humans are inherently antisocial and something has to happen for them to not engage in criminal behavior. So the most common or well-known uh, perspective would relate to Freud's psychodynamic theory, which characterizes three different key features of the individual. The id, which seeks to basically get immediate pleasure, it's that hedonistic uh, drive that we have. The ego, that sort of more reality-oriented thinking, like being rational, thinking about the consequences of our behavior. And the superego, which is our conscience and our internalizing of society's standards, it helps us regulate the id. So the superego is especially important, let's say, from a social control perspective, to understand why individuals would need to develop the superego in order to avoid becoming involved in criminal behavior. The idea would be that there are problems in the development of the superego that lead to crime. Parenting and trauma are the primary source of poor development of this superego. So remember Garbson and Hershey, they talked about low self-control developing because parents fail to properly parent their child. This is sort of drawing from Freud's psychodynamic theoretical perspective. It's the imbalance between these three that really is going to relate to criminal behavior. So the id might be out of control and the superego isn't able to properly regulate it, or the superego is underdeveloped and can't 
therefore regulate a normal functioning it. An older perspective that sort of developed from Freud was Erickson's, where he looked at identity development, where individuals can face crises over the life course, and these sort of problems, these stages must be resolved in order for the individual to progress in development. So these individuals need to kind of get closure through one stage of their life to be able to proceed through the next stage of their life where they're going to have to deal with different types of problems. So in childhood it might be, you know, dealing with the fact that you are away from your parents and you have to deal with the sort of uncomfort of being in an unfamiliar situation or where your protector isn't around to keep you safe. Then in school it might be, you know, navigating peer relationships. As you get into adulthood, it'll be dealing with you know an employer or a boss. Well, these are all different stages that an individual needs to progress through. So this was sort of the idea of how the superego would develop as a way to help deal with these different problems at these different life stages. The idea of superego has long been abandoned, but one of the sort of connections that we can see between the superego and more contemporary research is temperament. So temperament is kind of like a modern day version of superego. It's considered the sort of like the foundation or the building blocks of personality. We talked about this a little bit maybe in week two, where temperament focuses on two elements, the internal function of an individual, so it's their thought processes, their comfort in new situations, their ability to adapt to unfamiliar situations, and then external function, which deals with like excessive motor movement, and hyperactivity. So some of the dimensions of temperament in childhood include things like being daring, being uh, pro-social or anti-social, and negative emotionality. So daring is like the hyperactivity, the risk-taking, the willingness to do things that maybe are a violation of the rules. The pro-sociality is more about caring for how other people are feeling, wanting to help other people, wanting to make friends with other people, and so on. And then the negative emotionality is more of that internal function of how individuals respond to negative events in their life. Do they tend to have things like callous unemotional traits? Do they tend to not care about how their actions impact others? Or do they even enjoy bringing harm to other people? So this temperament is supposed to be able to help us regulate our behavior, kind of function in the same way that Freud was talking about the superego. We can also see how temperament can negatively impact someone's parenting style. So recall we made a distinction between authoritative parenting style and authoritarian parenting style, where authoritarian parenting style is basically the parent saying, do what, you told, do what you're told because I'm your parent and what I say goes. We also talked about that neglectful parenting style where the parent just basically ignores their child and leaves them to fend for themselves. A child's negative temperament can really alienate a parent. It can be very difficult for a parent to continue to engage in positive parenting strategies when they have a child that is constantly acting, um, like doesn't seem to even care about that parent. Recall that video clip that we watched in the film, We Have to Talk About Kevin, where the kid just does not care about having that interaction with other people. So the parent can adapt their parenting style from an authoritarian parenting strategy to a neglectful parenting strategy. So we have to talk about Kevin, maybe they just give up on trying to parent the child or maybe they take a more coercive approach to parenting to try and make the child fear the parent as opposed to wanting to abide by the parent's rules because they respect and care about that parent. So we can see this, we would call this a reciprocal process. Negative parenting strategies could alter a child's temperament, but a child's temperament can also alter a parenting style and these all can in turn lead to involvement in antisocial behavior. Another thing that we will talk about are cognitive theories. Cognitive theories focus on thought processes and interpretation of social and environmental cues and how individuals actually respond to these cues. So cognitive theories deal with deficits and distortions in like antisocial versus pro-social thinking and also limited problem-solving skills of antisocial persons. So how do individuals typically solve problems? Is it by reacting negatively, by drinking, using drugs, 
by hurting other people. Cognitive theories that's especially common but I'm not too keen on is making the distinction between reactive and proactive aggression. So reactive aggression, aggression that's usually in response to a perceived threat or a perceived insult from somebody else. Whereas proactive aggression, sometimes referred to as instrumental aggression or cold-blooded aggression, is usually done for some personal gain. This is a type of aggression that's more likely to be perpetrated against a stranger. So somebody, uh, an individual might just engage in a robbery. If they see somebody walking down the street, they have their iPhone out and they think, I want that iPhone. So they walk up behind the individual, hit them in the back of the head and take the iPhone. So there was no precursor to this aggression. There was no perceived insult or anything like that. It was done, you know, sort of in cold blood. There's a tendency for research to believe that this is useful for understanding why individuals with features of psychopathy may engage in different types of aggression, specifically why individuals with features of psychopathy will be more likely to engage in instrumental aggression because they're callous, they're unempathic, so they're more likely to engage in aggression without any actual precursor. The reason why I find that this perspective can be limited, this clear distinction between reactive and proactive aggression, is one is that individuals will engage in both proactive and reactive aggression. It's not as if all individuals specialize in either reactive aggression or either proactive aggression. The other problem is that certain acts can have elements of both reactive and proactive aggression. For example, I've interviewed a kid who talked to me about this exact example. If you have ever been to the Lohi Skytrain station and when you walk, there's a long ramp if you leave the Skytrain. If you're coming, you leave the Skytrain and you go left, you have to walk down this really long corridor that's kind of sectioned off, it's not well lit. And this one kid would pay attention to people walking off the Skytrain that looked like they would be vulnerable targets. They'd have their headphones on, maybe they were older or younger or smaller or anything like that. So he would identify these people who were wearing headphones and he would basically follow them down that hallway, causeway, down towards Lohi Mall. And while they were sort of in the middle of this darker, isolated walkway, he would assault them. So this sounds very much like instrumental aggression, but he would take things even further if there was any resistance or any comments from the victim. If the victim showed any resistance, he would react to this by assaulting them even further. So we can see in this single event elements of both reactive and proactive aggression. I won't expand on it because we talked about this already on the midterm, but it's seen in this slide here. There's one of the good things about cognitive theories is there's a very nice link between the theory and the intervention. So we can see with cognitive behavioral therapy a clear pathway between the identification of whether somebody maybe they might not specialize in reactive versus proactive aggression, but they might have a greater tendency for reactive aggression. So we can now begin to think about the types of intervention strategies that they need, how to rewrite the script of this reactive aggression style so that they use a different form of communication or a different form of problem solving in order to deal with the conflict that they're facing. We will spend the rest of today's class talking about mass shootings and school shootings. Fortunately, this isn't so common in Canada, but it's also something that people are commonly concerned about, it's something that we see discussed a lot in the media, and I think it's important to discuss, especially because the way it's discussed in the media definitely doesn't reflect how it's thought about in actual research. So in this slide you'll see a bunch of tweets and uh, newspaper, news article headings where the very common term used to describe mass shootings is that they are senseless, that they're unpredictable, that nobody can understand why somebody would do this. And I understand this sentiment, I understand why people will use terms like how it's senseless because they cannot ever begin to understand how they would get to a point where they would commit a school shooting. So all the people who are calling this act senseless basically aren't looking at this perspective through the eyes of the perpetrator. They're looking at it from their own perspective. They can never see how they would get to a point where they would commit such an awful act of violence. 
I think we need to change that perspective. Where we need to understand things from the perspective of the person committing the school shooting or the mass shooting. And people get uncomfortable with this idea because it makes it sound like we're trying to empathize with the shooter. And that's not what we're trying to do at all. We're looking at why they specifically thought that this was a rational act, why this made sense to that particular individual. Not to excuse them from their behavior, but because if we want to prevent something, we have to actually understand it first. And everybody is saying that these school shootings are unpredictable and senseless, basically are doing nothing to contribute to how we're actually going to prevent these in the future. While it might be uncomfortable to think about perpetrating a school shooting from the perspective of somebody who's involved in this type of offense, it is, it's necessary to be able to try and prevent this harm in the future. So that's how I try to think about it. It's not about glorifying school shootings or putting the emphasis on the shooter. It's about trying to make sure that these acts don't happen again so that we can prevent harm to future victims. We can reduce the number of victims that are actually in our society. I think it's maybe a bit naive or even arrogant for researchers to think that they can end school shootings or that they're trying to end all violence. I think we will always have violence in our society, but the goal is to reduce the amount of violence, to reduce the amount of harm. And this begins with putting an end towards this idea that violence is always pointless or senseless. Research on and attitudes towards mass shootings and school shootings really need psychological perspectives. This is where psychology has a lot to help make sense of these seemingly irrational acts. So we need to go back and understand a little bit of criminology's history, which has really been primarily developed by sociologists studying crime. Sutherland was a big time sociologist focusing on differential association theory, and he wanted criminology to be studied only by sociologists. From this sociological perspective, there tended to be an emphasis on things like rational choice. We've seen rational choice theory talked about maybe a little bit in this class, but definitely if you take Crim 101 or Crim 104, 104 is sociological explanations of criminal behavior, you'll probably come into contact with the rational choice theory, which has this presumption that individuals will commit crime if the rewards outweigh the costs. And it's based on this idea that individuals will look at like the likelihood that they're going to get caught, the consequences of getting caught, and this will all factor into their decision to engage in criminal behavior. And I think this perspective is really not useful for understanding really serious and violent crimes like school shootings and like mass shootings. The reason why is that individuals that engage in this type of criminal behavior tend to not have the same type of rational perspective that the average citizen, the like average citizen can still widely range in terms of their perspectives, ideals, values, and so on. One of the reasons why people tend to see mass shooting as pointless is because from their rational calculation, there was no good reason for this offense. What we need to do is understand that for persons that have experienced a wide range of different risk factors, or persons with a mental illness, they might not see reality the way that we do. People can have different realities because it's all about perception. I do believe that there is a, a true, objective, empirical reality that can exist with things like gravity, um, natural laws, but when it comes to perceptions, these can vary across individuals. Somebody with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder may not be able to interpret the positives and negatives in a given situation. Their ability to perform a rational calculus of the pros and cons might be more limited compared to what somebody in this class might be able to do. So when it comes to school shootings, the reason why somebody might engage in a behavior might not seem rational from an outsider's perspective, but once we begin to look at those internal factors, the factors experienced by the individual perpetrating the shooting, we can begin to understand 
why they might have perpetrated that crime, even though it might not make sense for the average individual to do so. so this is really why we need psychological perspectives to understand possible mental disorders associated with the individual or possible risk factors associated with the individual. In saying that, we then also have to be very careful to not presume that having a particular mental disorder places somebody at a really high risk for engaging in one of these crimes. Persons with a mental illness, regardless of the type of mental illness, even features of psychopathy, are going to be at a low likelihood of committing a school shooting. So there's a lot more that goes into understanding this crime than just the mental illness or just the experience of bullying or abuse or just access to firearms. We have to really look at things from a multidisciplinary perspective and this is where criminology has really been lacking. Sutherland, sociologists wanted crime to be studied only by sociologists. Sutherland was so famous that he really began to have his way from the 1960s up until like the 1980s where criminology was dominated by sociologists. And so crime was really only looked at from this one single narrow perspective. We've seen a bit of change where we can look at crime through the perspective of economists, sociologists, psychologists, public health officials or epidemiologists, but we will fail to really synthesize and integrate those different perspectives into a cohesive, singular explanation of a phenomenon. But what I think people have really tried to do is bring these different perspectives together to understand mass shootings and school shootings, and so that's what we'll look at today. We'll look now at some of the characteristics of school shootings and mass shootings that have been identified in the research. One factor that provides evidence that school shootings are not random is the fact that so many of them are indeed planned. Most school shooters formulate plans at least two days before the attack. So it's not as if they're getting bullied, they have a problem in a classroom, and they go straight to their locker to grab a gun. There's no signs or no warning signs that this event was actually going to occur. These plans include the creation of hit lists and do not kill this. Suicide notes that are left on computers before the shooting, maps of schools, plots on social media, so where individuals will actually state on Twitter that they are going to engage in this type of behavior, and records of a person's search history showing that they have actually been extensively researching mass shootings or school shootings. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who were part of the Columbine, or were the two perpetrators of the Columbine shooting in Colorado, they invested more than a year of planning prior to actually engaging in their attack. So these had strategies like creating lists and rationales for who they would shoot and who they would not shoot. This is showing that there was opportunities, or there were opportunities prior to the offense could have alerted authorities to the fact that this event was going to occur. So this extensive planning really shows that their assaults were serving a purpose, a completely unjustified purpose, but one where it demonstrates that they're not senseless. They made sense to the individuals committing the shootings because they had spent so much time actually planning them. They would also talk about like how they wanted to be known for the shooting, sort of see this as an example of being macho. So they were talking about these openly and it's something that can be eventually actually prevented if we have the right strategies in place to understand the warning signs. When it comes to individual level factors, of the individual perpetrating the shooting. Typically these individuals are male and white. It's somewhat rare actually that they suffer from a very severe mental illness, though this can definitely be debated. It's true though that these individuals tend to have a history of suicidal thoughts and depression. So depression is actually a mental illness. Suicidal ideation is a mental illness. What the research is saying though is that rarely do these individuals have mental disorders like schizophrenia, where they might be going through like auditory hallucinations and that's why they perpetrate the offense. Individuals tend to have negative relationships with peers, so they tend to be maybe a social outcast and have difficulty getting along with others and this can lead to them feeling disempowered and emasculated. Such individuals do not tend to have evidence of like a prior criminal record for violent or aggressive behavior, but they do have difficulty coping with conflicts in their environment. So it's not just that they have conflict with other people, it's not just that they have negative relationships with their peers, 
is that they have difficulty coping with these problems, which is why cognitive behavioral therapy might be a good intervening factor. And if individuals who are struggling with coping with different negative life events receive appropriate treatment, not only can this perhaps help prevent minor forms of violence and aggression, but also these really much more serious forms of violence as well. I mentioned at the outset why I really thought that psychological explanations were critical to understanding school shootings, but this doesn't mean that they are the only factor that matters. The macro level factors that can matter include high unemployment rates, where we see spikes in the rate of school shootings in a given area. These tend to be correlated with increases in unemployment. It's so important that we have this integration. We talked about individual level characteristics being things like the inability to cope. Well, it's not just the inability to cope with sort of micro level interactions between individuals. It can also be the inability to cope with macro level stressors. Higher levels of unemployment signal difficulties in finding a job or that the cost of going to university might be higher. For those that have troubles coping or don't have a very good support network, as I mentioned, things like having negative peer relationships, these particularly insecure kids might be very fearful of what's to come in their future. They're about to leave, say, school or about to leave college and enter a world of a lot of uncertainty, especially when the economy is really poor. This possibly is just an additional factor that becomes too much for the individual to actually cope with. Why are individuals that are white more likely to engage in school shootings? Why are males more likely to engage in school shootings? One of the possible explanations, and this is just a hypothesis that some researchers have, is that this increasing uncertainty might be more problematic for white males because they have a poor or weaker ability to actually deal with strength. These individuals are lacking the coping skills to deal with things. Before we look at location, I want to just briefly mention the importance of understanding dose-response effect. This is taken from the medical literature and medical research where, for example, if you take one Tylenol tablet, you might not experience very much of an alleviation of headache symptoms. But if you take two tablets, you might experience a complete alleviation of symptoms. So it's not as if uh, you take one tablet and your symptoms are reduced by half, and then you take two tablets and your symptoms are reduced by another half to totally get rid of it. The addition of going from 1 to 2 is different from the movement from 0 to 1. So from 1 to 2, the impact on the individual is much greater than moving from 0 to 1. So how do we think about this from a risk factor perspective? The idea is that the risk of a school shooting when moving from 0 risk factors to 1 risk factor is much different than the risk of committing a school shooting when going from 9 risk factors to 10 risk factors. The jump from 9 risk factors to 10 risk factors increases the risk much more than the jump from 0 risk factors to 1 risk factor. So that's why we need to be really considering all of these different risk factors. And another one that matters is the location that an individual is embedded within. So this can matter both for the school location and the city location that an individual resides in. So large scale shootings are much more likely to occur in the suburbs and at rural schools as well as a less diverse community. So if the community is more homogeneous, like more commonly comprised of individuals that share the same religious beliefs or political attitudes, this is where crime tends to occur or where shootings tend to occur. When the location is more socially and politically conservative, then we're more likely to also see a school shooting. If it's a smaller town, the conflict an individual might have with peers can be amplified because more people are likely to be aware of it. So there's a humiliating closeness that sort of creates pressure on individuals when they're embedded in small towns. What can also matter is school culture. School culture matters for several reasons. Schools tend to be intolerant of differences. So individuals who stand out because they may, like in the United States, they don't care about high school football, they listen to a particular type of music, they dress a certain way. All of these things amplify in settings where other people are less tolerant of these differences. 
This is where issues of bullying and marginalization tend to not be addressed. School culture is such that bullying is almost condoned because it's against a person who isn't fitting in to begin with. So that's something that really needs to change. Another thing that needs to change is when schools use zero tolerance policies. What this means is if an individual goes against a particular school rule, even something as minor as getting into a fist fight in a schoolyard, this can create scenarios where kids do not want to tell teachers about this fight because the zero tolerance policy means that if you break this rule, you're suspended or you're expelled. There are no exceptions or zero tolerance for this particular type of behavior. So kids will not inform on their peers because they don't want to get that individual in so much trouble that they actually get kicked out of school. So these zero tolerance policies help sweep these types of behaviors under the rug because kids don't want to confide in adults. Another problem for schools is when they have a low teacher to student ratio. And this is also more likely to occur in neighborhoods that are impoverished, where they can't afford to hire as many teachers. This is a really big problem in the United States. The neighborhood-based tax income is what goes towards funding the school. So in areas with low income, they have less tax dollars to contribute to funding these schools, which means there are less resources available in those schools. The five-stage sequential model tries to put together a bunch of these different factors to understand how mass shootings develop because again, it's not any one factor that's going to be helpful for us in understanding this type of behavior. So the five stage sequential model looks at how an individual progresses from experiencing chronic strain to an uncontrolled strain to acute strain to beginning to plan the actual attack and then to the actual perpetration of the act. Chronic strain is describing when the strain becomes so intense and continues for a considerable amount of time. It's not that an individual experiences one instance of strain or repeatedly experiences really minor strains. It's that chronic and intense or severe strain that is going to be the first stage in this sequential model. Most school shooters felt bullied, threatened, or injured by others. And this is the work of Leary, Kowalski, Smith, and Phillips, where they found that 13 out of 15 school shooting incidents that they reviewed were characterized by individuals that had felt chronic forms of rejection and strain from peers. So it's not as if an individual experiences chronic strain and then a school shooting happens. From the perspective of this model, it's that the individual has to go through all five of these stages. So upon experiencing chronic strain, what will then happen is that an individual begins to lose these like social ties and social connections that can help them deal with the strain. So this is why they refer to it as uncontrolled strain. The strain of everyday life are left unchecked because the individual doesn't have a pro-social relationship or a conventional relationship. They lack the teachers to intervene or the parents to intervene and that's why the strain becomes uncontrolled. The individual is really socially isolated and they have a lack of a pro-social support system that can help them deal with this chronic strain. So we move from that chronic strain to an uncontrolled strain and then to an acute strain. What happens at this stage is that an individual will experience a very short-term negative event that can even be quite minor but it's perceived as particularly devastating by the individual because they have their resources, their ability to cope has been depleted so substantially, they aren't able to deal with even minor events or stressors. So take for example, like the individual who's been chronically bullied, parents are abusive, teachers don't care about them, they ask a kid for a pencil in class and they say no. This should be something that they could very easily deal with but because they've experienced such a negative life to this point, they don't have the resources or the coping strategies available to deal with this very minor inconvenience. They recognize that this is a minor inconvenience. They understand, I can't actually deal with 
this type of stressor? How am I actually going to get through my own entire life, especially when I'm facing leaving school or leaving college or university? To give like more of like a biological example, we have this experience ourselves with our immune system. When I was an undergrad student, every Christmas for four straight years I would get sick because I would be dealing with the stress of studying for final exams for the fall semester. So I'd be experiencing that chronic strain, depletion of resources, social isolation, and go take the exam. And that chronic strain would make me vulnerable to very acute strains in terms of getting sick. BC, cold, wet weather, get exposed to rain, and all of a sudden I'm sick for two and a half weeks because my ability to cope with that minor stressor was very, very low. Acute strain is this idea that it will matter when only when in the presence of chronic and uncontrolled strain. If I can't deal with this type of acute strain, how am I going to get through my entire life? So it's kind of very catastrophic to an individual's psyche because they believe that there's really no other choice. They have no other options in life. Once an individual believes that they have no real other alternatives, or that their life is hopeless, they feel very down, depressed, that can lead to the planning stage where the individual begins to think about getting revenge. So remember one of those individual level risk factors was that feeling of emasculation. And a shooting is, and again like this goes back to the ideas of toxic masculinity, but this shooting is perceived as a way to get back their masculinity, to regain some feeling of control. So the individual begins to fantasize and those fantasies can become realities or actual plans. So as I mentioned, individuals will take about two days before carrying out the attack, but some can spend much, much longer and we can see evidence of the planning. If there was more parental intervention, paying attention to what the individual is doing on the internet, Teachers were more likely to intervene or give this individual some sense of, hey, we can control this strain. We can help you with this. We can create some form of positive social environment for you. This could deter these plants from actually manifesting. But unfortunately, in the cases that we'll review, these instances don't actually happen because the individual is already in such a negative environment. Really, the intervention is much more likely to come before the planning stage if it's going to be successful in preventing uh, attack. And then the final stage is obviously perpetration. The individual actually has to have access to firearms or to weapons, so there has to be some form of accessibility for the individual to physically be able to carry out the attack. So planning and the experiences of strain will only matter for a school shooting if the individual has the actual environmental access to weapons. Again, to reiterate, most individuals that experience bullying or severe isolation do not perpetrate mass shootings. As I mentioned at the beginning of the class, theories are only good, valuable, and useful if they can be supported empirically. And we can look at empirical support both quantitatively, where we would study, we would apply this model to many mass shootings, or we can look at it qualitatively, where we can look in depth at one single mass shooting. When it comes to your term paper, you'll be doing more of a qualitative validation by focusing on a single case. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna focus on Adam Lanza and the Sandy Hook shooting and see the extent to which this sequential model can help us to understand the development of this crime. I'll post some newspaper articles and other articles to Canvas that provide some greater background to Adam Lanza's school shooting, but for now we'll just focus on the specific details that relate to the five-stage sequential model, beginning with chronic strain. So Lanza experienced a ton of chronic strain, both at home and at school, and as well as from his own debilitating mental health issues. I mentioned that most school shooters don't have a severe mental illness, but in Lanza's case, it did appear that he did have a severe mental illness. One of the sources of strain came from when Lanza's parents separated in 2001. Divorce is very common. So again, divorce is very common. So again, it's important not to think, oh, is divorce a risk factor for school shootings? No, not really, but it's the witness to the deterioration of the relationship between parents that led to 
uh, Lanza's father moving away, and basically this led to Lanza being even more socially isolated because his father really remarried and wanted nothing to do with Lanza thereafter. So let's look at some of the details of Lanza's strength. He killed his mother prior to the school shooting, which can suggest that he was experiencing some strain at home. One person said that Lanza had described his mother as strained, his relationship with his mother as strained because he viewed her behavior as not rational. He had been diagnosed with Asperger's, but there's also suggestions that he actually had a more significant mental health problems, specifically that he had schizophrenia, paranoid type, and this could have impacted his ability to cope with different forms of strength being bullied, having Asperger's, being socially isolated, he spent a lot of time at home in his room. These could all have contributed to that chronic feeling of strain. There was also evidence of uncontrolled strain in Lanza's background. He had few interpersonal relationships, and the relationships he did have tended to be with family members and were quite strained and not necessarily positive interpersonal relationships. So at school, he really had no relationships. And at home, the relationships he had tended to be negative or disappointing, such as when his father moved away and kind of left him on his own, remarried and focused on his new family. For about two years before the shooting, Lanza had no contact with his father and his older brother. So those people that are supposed to be sources of social support weren't actually around. He stopped engaging in social activities altogether, and in like grades 9 and 10, he really spent his entire day skipping school, being reclusive, spending time locked in his bedroom, playing video games all day. So Lanza's lack of friends basically means that the chronic strain he was experiencing was left unchecked, making him very susceptible to acute strains. In the days prior to the shooting at Sandy Hook, Lanza had been left home alone because his mother had plans to sell their house and move the family out of state, either to Washington State or North Carolina. They were living up in South Carolina at the time. This meant that the individual that was already socially isolated was dealing with the possibility of moving to a new situation. And as I mentioned at the start of the class, for individuals with difficulties with temperament, they're not necessarily able to adapt to these new situations. So this can be quite fear-inducing to have to go to this new unfamiliar place. So although for most people like, a move is not especially traumatic or concerning, when we are dealing with an individual that has severe anxiety and other mental health issues, this can be particularly problematic. Lanza had refused to actually go with his mom and stay in a hotel again because worried about going to new situations or new environments. His anxiety was so high that he didn't want to really leave his room at all. So you begin to realize, like, how am I going to live my life if I'm afraid to even live, leave my room? I'm about to graduate high school. The expectation is that you move out when you're 18, you get a job. For this individual, he can't see how he's going to function in life. And again, this does not give any justification for the behavior. It does not excuse the behavior, but it helps us begin to understand why that behavior actually occurred in the first place. You see that he has acute strength, then led to the involvement in the actual planning. And if you look at sort of reports on this Lanza shooting, in a spreadsheet that sort of listed and described other mass murders, describing the incidents. This was all found on his computer. He had purposely tried to damage his hard drive, which again shows his evidence of planning. He didn't want people to know what he was up to. And he also talked about school shooters online. So one of his, like hard to say a friend, but an internet-based acquaintance, he had actually constantly brought up the subject of school shooters to this person. And finally, when we look at the perpetration stage, which isn't the greatest, most aptly named stage, because perpetration just sounds like, did they commit it, yes or no? What it's really describing is like the accessibility or the opportunity to actually carry out the planned attack. So did he have access to the resources he would need to perpetrate this offense? In this case, with Adam Lanza, all the firearm that he had used had been legally purchased by his mother, and his mother had actually been referred to as a gun nut. 
Lanza, for Christmas, had received basically a blank check from his mom that, in like the, the memo, said it's for the purpose of buying another mm -hmm. gun. So in this case, Lanza had a lot of opportunity and accessibility to things that would be needed to actually go and perpetrate this type of offense. In summary, we can see all five elements of the sequential model were present in Lanza's case. This doesn't mean that the model will be universally useful, but it does show how we can, in some instances, begin to make sense of this type of crime. Talking about school shootings can also make us very nervous because we spend a lot of our time at school. One of the take home messages though is the idea that schools are not dangerous for kids. The risk of homicide for a kid is 225 times greater when they are outside of school compared to when they are in school. Only about 1 in 2 million youth will die from homicide or suicide at school each year. This isn't meant to say like, oh, we don't need to carry or worry about school shootings or suicide, anything like that. Obviously, by the fact that we're having this lecture, I'm saying that these are important issues that we're really trying to address, but it's also important not to create this moral panic where people are fearful to go to school. Any given school can expect to experience a school shooting once on every out of every 6,000 years. SFU would expect to experience a school shooting one out of every 6,000 years, so if it's developed in 1970, on average, SFU would experience a school shooting once between now and the year 7,000, basically. Important to deal with, but also important to not overstate the scope of, of the problem. School shootings are very rare, which means they are very difficult to prevent as well. But there are examples of instances where such planned attacks were prevented. And this example comes right from in Vancouver at Templeton High School. I actually ended up interviewing this individual while they were in custody. He had planned to attack uh, individuals, had wrote online about how he planned to uh, engage in shootings. He said to individuals at school that basically, you're number 25 on my list. I'm going to get you. I'm going to kill you. Students actually decided to go and talk to the police officer about the comments that had been made by this individual. Police officer fortunately also took it seriously because graduation was just about to occur. Remember that graduation entering adulthood can really be a source of strength. So they were worried that this individual was going to fall through on these threats at a school dance and they ended up raiding his home where they found guns, machetes. He had posted pictures online of him with guns and things like that. So this was a very potentially real attack that was thwarted. So we can look at some of the reasons for why this might have been prevented. First, there was no zero tolerance policy at the school. So the students were more willing to go and talk to police. Hoover, there's more diversity. We still have a lot of problems with racism. We have a long way to go in terms of having better anti-racism efforts. But this diversity is better than homogeneity where everybody expects everyone to conform, to fall in line, to all dress the same, act the same, and so on. In this case, we saw that an individual was acting different, and other people wanted to intervene without bullying, and we see the resolution of this case where nobody was actually hurt. Finally, just to sort of summarize the key findings, to remind individuals that mass shootings are very rarely impulsive, they're typically planned, other people were even aware of these planned individual made statements to that effect online. Direct threats to specific individuals are atypical. It's usually more general or broad threats, though as we saw in that Templeton case, there was an instance where the individual was directly saying to another student, you're number 25. There's no profile of the school shooter, so there's no clear, like, here are the three things that all school shooters have in common. However, common characteristics are that they usually had prior behavioral problems or concerns, not necessarily a criminal record, but difficulty coping with behavior, difficulty getting along with other students. They tended to have major depression and they tended to have access to weapons. So that's it for our week on describing violence. We just talked about 
involvement in real serious and violent offenses that I think will be useful for applying to some of your case studies in the future. We'll talk to everybody next week.